Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chad Griffiths. I'm the host of the Industrial Real Estate Show, and I'm super excited to be back for another episode. My guest has a very... Oh, sorry, I got some actually background music going for one second here. Okay, I think we're fixed. Look at that technical difficulty starting off the episode already. Uh, so my guest this week is a former accountant and internal auditor who's transitioned full-time into real estate investing. And the exciting thing that we're going to talk to him about this week is industrial outdoor storage. So he's got a background in self-storage, but he also has a 13-acre site uh, that he's converted into industrial outdoor storage. So we're going to go through uh, how he decided to make that shift towards uh, leasing it out to different companies. And I just want to get some of his background, talk about industrial outdoor storage uh, as well, and welcome any questions that come up, uh, whether you want to hear about his time as an internal auditor, or whether you want to uh, hear how, what his strategy is, or what his projections for the future are. We'll take any questions that you have. And I'm excited to uh, bring on our guest, Michael Rogers. Michael, thanks so much for joining me on the show. Hey, Chad. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So let's get into your background first, because I find it fascinating uh, that you're an accountant and an internal auditor and then transition full time into real estate investing. I'm sure that there's a good story in there. Uh, so why don't you take me back to even how, even before you got into real estate investing, just your journey becoming an accountant and getting into the auditing space? Yeah, so um, I'm 44 and I went to school. And my dad was a CPA and they kind of told me, you know, accounting, that's the language of business. You know, you understand where all the money is going. And so it's just a good degree to understand business. I was always entrepreneurial. I always liked entrepreneurship, business of all kinds. And so I got a degree in that. And when I graduated, I went to work for a CPA firm, a regional CPA firm. Worked there for about five years. It was good experience auditing. You got to see a lot of different businesses. You saw with certain businesses, what they did well, with businesses that didn't do well, what they did. And then I got in kind of a niche of doing internal controls auditing. Um, so basically internal audit. And I worked at a, a couple of insurance companies. And the last, but my passion during that is I really loved real estate. I loved um, entrepreneurship. And so I bought some properties along the way. And when I eventually got to the last four, three years or so, I was able to go part time. My employer was very, very flexible and they were very good to me. And I sort of stepped off with part time and did um, real estate and worked at that job as well until I finally, about five years ago, was able to go full time doing this. Um, I started out and bought some duplexes, um, some residential property. I did that probably back in like 2005, 2006. This was pre real estate crash. Um, I owned a few of those. I never really paid way too much. I didn't do great on it, but I didn't, I didn't get in trouble or anything. I bought them at reasonable prices. And I, about that time, I really got into like Warren Buffett and the idea of value investing. I was following him. And then you had the crash of 2008, 2009. And, you know, I was following him. I've read all his stories. And basically the idea was you kind of pick a niche of what you're really good at or what you understand well. And you kind of stay within them in that. And you allow for margins of safety and buy things at a discount. And so I was like, I'm, I can apply this to real estate. I understand my market. I understand these these things and houses were selling at unbelievable discounts here in, in the United States. And so I was able to pick up several of those and I did that for a while. And then I picked up during that four or five years, I picked up uh, three self-storage facilities, bought those at good discounts and taken care of them. And self-storage has gotten really hot in the last couple of years. I kind of got into it before that got hot. And now it's harder to buy them at, a, at any really you can't buy them at a discount. They're so so hot, like a lot of parts of real estate. Um, so I've kind of lived off that. Um, and then I guess about two or three years ago, pre right before pre pandemic, I started looking around and saying, you know, so storage is really hot housing. If, if you're flipping houses, there's so many people that are in that you, you go to look at a house and there'd be five other people there uh, looking to do the same thing you are. So you just, you weren't going to get a discount on buying and have any margin of safety. Or I wasn't, I didn't feel comfortable. There's a lot of people who have still done very well doing it. And so I started looking around and, and I live basically outside Chattanooga, Tennessee. And Chattanooga is right along I-75, which is a major interstate. And it's really big for logistics. Uh, we had one of the first big freight brokerages came out of Chattanooga Access America. There's a couple of big truck companies, U.S. Express and Covenant are located in Chattanooga. So there's a lot of logistics stuff. And I've got some buddies that are in logistics. And I started looking around saying, you know, 
what can I do next? And that's where I found a piece of property. I thought, I'm going to do a warehouse. I'm going to build a, you know, a big industrial warehouse. And from there, I kind of, as time went on, I transitioned into doing, uh, kind of put that on side and decided to do industrial outdoor storage and truck parking. So that's a quick two or three minute uh, overview of where, where I am now. So tell me a little bit more about the market. So you're actually in a, in a suburb outside of Chattanooga called Cleveland. And we talked a little yes. bit about that. I myself would have thought that was in Ohio, not in Tennessee. Uh, so a little, you said about 25 minutes outside of Chattanooga. You obviously follow Chattanooga in that area quite well. Uh, tell me a little bit more about that market. I'm just kind of curious what's going on in that area. It's done really well. Um, you know, since the pandemic, you had there's certain areas, I guess, of the country for political reasons or whatever that have had net out migration and net in migration. Chattanooga, Tennessee is very business friendly. Uh, so you've had a lot of people since the pandemic move in. So there's been a, you know, it's, 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 it's very pro business. We've got a Volkswagen manufacturer here. We've got a lot of business coming into Chattanooga and Tennessee. Uh, Cleveland's just outside. It's kind of like you said, a suburb or area just outside of that main area. There's, kind of a lack of land in Chattanooga. Um, so they're, they're spreading out, you know, for these industrial, um, industrial sites, they, you know, you have to kind of move out. And so Cleveland's benefited from that. I, I saw a report, and I don't know how much you follow other markets in Tennessee, but I saw a report last year that was talking about the difference in rates across the U.S., and they used Memphis, which was actually the lowest market per, per square foot, and they compared it to New York. Uh, and Memphis, I don't remember the exact number, but it was something like $4 a square foot was the average industrial lease rate, whereas New York was $20 a square foot. Are you yeah. seeing much of that? Like, is... is Chattanooga and Tennessee as a whole is it is it growing is is there interest in people coming to the state or what's what what do you think would drive that huge spread between New York and and a, and a smaller market like Memphis yeah I would say probably the big thing is you know if you're out on the west coast or the east coast when you've got this huge population density there's this big demand you know if you're the Inland Empire or, or you know out in Los Angeles or whatever, you've got so many people there, then there's only so much land and you just don't have enough room to build these big warehouses. So if you've got one, you can charge whatever you want. Same thing in New York. And so there's, there's just not as much population, uh, comparably, um, uh, the rents, I would don't hold me to it. I would say industrial rents probably in Chattanooga is, uh, I haven't looked at everything five to, ten dollars a foot somewhere in there depending on the condition of the property ceiling heights and parking and so forth um but but all as everywhere they've all gone up over the last couple of years since the pandemic and like you said on self-storage that does seem to be a ultra hot market right now where uh, all you need to do is go onto twitter and see all the people talking about self-storage uh it's crazy that and they're looking everywhere too so if someone was originally interested in self-storage in texas as an example and that's where they focused now they're expanding to they'll look at self-storage in any medium-sized market and up so that yeah. has become a really hot market i think industrial outdoor storage will get there too because we're seeing a lot more institutional interest in it there's funds popping up large groups that are trying to buy well-positioned sites all over so you've got a 13 acre site i'd love to hear how you were going to do a large warehouse i think it was 200,000 square feet is what you were originally planning and then you shifted to industrial outdoor storage what was the what was the impetus what what dis prompted you to say okay you know what let's Let's hold off on the development. Let's look at the storage. Yeah. So for me, I started kind of trying to network and my goal was to find a build a suit tenant to build, you know, even if I had to build a 50,000 square foot building or a hundred thousand square foot building. And the thing I kept running into was for the most part, people were like, I need store, I need warehouse 30 days, 60 days. I don't need it a year and a half out. And particularly, you know, last year I would be looking at, you know, talking to these builders and they'd be like, you know, we can't get steel for these things for six months a year. Mm -hmm. So you had this huge lag time. And the thing I kept coming back to as I was talking to people in the logistics community is like, you know, we really need somewhere to park our trailers or our trucks. You know, you just can't find truck parking. It's a nationally, there's this real huge um, shortage of truck parking. Uh, these guys you'll see them parked on the, if you're in the United States, I don't know how it is in Canada, 
But if you're in the United States, there's some laws that they can only drive for a certain period of window. And then once they get to the end of that window, they've got to stop and pull over. And so they spend, particularly in the evenings, there's nowhere to park. There's just not enough parking. They'll be parked on the side of the road, on the interstates or on ramps or off ramps, just trying to find somewhere. So there's this massive shortage of it. And I thought, well, you know, rather than put out four or five, six million dollars on this building, build a spec building. And I don't know what's going to happen. Most likely it's going to run out, but you could sit there for six months or a year or longer. Or if you have a big recession and, you know, you're just kind of bleeding to death, um, paying interest, taxes, um, insurance. I thought, well, you know, I can take a small section of this and gravel it out and do truck park. I know there's a demand for that. It's a much smaller um, outlay of cash and just see how it goes. And if it goes well, then I can keep going. And it, and it has, you know, we, we did that. I guess we opened in July and it filled out within about three months or so. We had about 20 spots filled up and they stayed pretty full. We're going to do some more. We've had so much rain here the last two or three months. We hadn't been able to move dirt to to expand it out. But as soon as it stops raining and we get a little bit of drier weather, we're going to add some additional space to it. Are you leasing those out individually to the truck truckers or to a company? Yeah, um, I'm open to either. But what it's been so far is it's been a lot of owner operators that <clears throat> they can't they don't have to park a, a 73 foot tractor trailer mm -hmm. or even if they've just got their bobtail which is just the truck park a lot of hoa neighborhoods don't allow them to park those things in their neighborhood so they've got to have somewhere to park them and they don't they're they're just not that much space so these folks will run them for me month to month um, that's probably the majority has been owner operators but there's a lot of businesses that'll they'll rent them for their truckers and you know they'll rent three or four of them and just have those full time. I've got a, a guy that um, the business that just needs somewhere to park some inventory for one of the businesses they haul it for. They they haul um, uh, these excavate these big excavators, and so they'll they'll want to just park those things there for some period of time. But, but you can park anything on it, dust round or short storage. It doesn't have to be a truck. You know, there'll be trailers, cargo containers, construction equipment, vehicles. Um, you know, it's just whatever you want to store. So I've got a I've got a handful of questions just to throw throw at you here. Uh, so oh, I, I see uh, uh, Beverly joined in too. Uh, hi, Chad. Hi, Michael. Looking forward to today's episode. Uh, thanks for joining. In. It's actually Beverly's birthday today. So if anyone's tuned in, you want to wish birthday. Beverly a happy birthday. Uh, thanks for joining in, Beverly. And again, I welcome any questions that you have uh, for Michael on uh, outdoor storage. Uh, so the first question I have is: You mentioned that you're graveling these. What what standard are you graveling that to? And can you share some of the costs that it, that it took to get to that level? Yeah, we'll put uh, my nine inches of gravel down. Uh, they'll go in, they'll, they'll grade out, strip off the amount of topsoil and pound that down. And then they'll put um, some, I think it's like number four, like four inch top gravel, bigger gravel. And then they'll come out and put like a crusher run down there and, and pack it in there. And we still have to work it. I mean, it takes a while for that stuff. You know, you pick a big, heavy semi tractor trailer comes through there it, it makes some some dents in it and so we'll have to go back occasionally and they'll come out with skid steer and some more gravel and smooth it out um i'm trying to think price wise i would say an acre of that everything we had in it don't hold me to this number somewhere between the 60 70 thousand dollars and in, in, in cost there I, I i haven't looked at that number recently so i'm not 100 percent sure but it's somewhere in there but for what it costs to get the materials, smooth it out, do the dirt work, um, and some of the cost involved in that. Yeah, that's that seems similar to some of the ones that, that I've heard of recently as well. Uh, on the utility front, is the do you have utilities to the to the curb essentially right now? Are you running any electrical so they have lights or plugins, or are you just leaving it just just the dirt essentially with a gravel top layer? We've got gravel. We went ahead on this first part. We put up a couple of big lights so that the area is lit. We've got some video cameras and we've got some um, some basic um, outlets that are on those poles that if they want to run a uh, an extension cord to it and power something they can. Uh, for the, there's been one tenant that wanted that. The rest of the truckers haven't particularly wanted that or they haven't used it. Um, I think they're mainly concerned that it's fenced in somewhere safe. They can park their car when they're on the road. Um, traveling around on their truck um those seem to be the, the main things they're interested in have you have you fenced the site or is it just is it open yep 
bought it, it was actually fenced in. So that's been a nice, we got a good deal. We bought this pre-pandemic and it had sat there for a while and it had a kind of a private road that went in that had been, that had been paved. It had um, all the, I guess the fire hydrant and the big plumbing that, that had to go in for the, the hydrants and some of the key utilities are already in there. Uh, so we were fortunate to have that and it was fenced all the way around most part all the way around the perimeter so we were able to benefit from that yeah and that's i guess just one thing that i'd, I'd really like to emphasize to people that are considering doing industrial outdoor storage is that you've got the cost like you said of of taking off the topsoil laying down some gravel uh i've heard anywhere from like nine to 18 inches is, is pretty common 18 being on the heavier side uh but then you also need to account for fencing the site so you have some security uh, because if people are using it for outdoor storage it's open to the elements and that's where you could have theft pretty easily so you have to account for fencing in there and then you likely have to account for some sort of utility distribution whether it's just running electrical like you said for for lights or cameras just to give people peace of mind so uh, it's it's not just as easy as buying a piece of farmland and then all of a sudden have being able to have people come in and park vehicles or put equipment down or storage or pipe or whatever uh, the different types of uses that people might want for industrial door storage. There could be more to it. So I, I'm glad you're able to to talk on that. I, I guess that leads to the next point on on rent. What so you said most of it is month to month, uh, and and I'm guessing that from a banking standpoint, have you talked to you're a lender yet on how that they would view that source of income if it is only month to month. I, I guess what I'm really trying to extract is if there's if it's financeable if you have those short term month to month tenants. Funded a lot of it um, with individual capital, but we do have a small loan on it, and they've not. I think they almost view it similar to self storage. Self storage is month to month leases as well. Um, if you've got a somewhat diversified group of people. Um, you've got lots of tenants and you've got a track record of them staying full. I, I have not had, had them come to me and say, we need a long term lease on this. We just charge for a 14 foot wide by 75 foot trucking spot. We'll charge one hundred and fifty dollars a month. And it's just a month to month lease. Now, we're open to somebody comes in and says, hey, we'd like to have that two acres right there. And we're going to do make a drop yard. You know, we're just going to we need this for our whole facility. We'll work with them and do them, a, you know, a five year lease or three-year lease or whatever they want. Uh, but so far, we're just kind of focused on just doing these uh, smaller, smaller tenants. And I, I will say one of the points you were mentioned on, you know, you just can't find a piece of farmland. That That's a good point. The thing that's made these industrial outdoor storage so hot and where you've seen so much capital flowing into it is there's quite a bit of barriers to entry. Um, you can't just put them anywhere. You've got to find somewhere that's zoned industrial, um, particularly when you get in a lot of these uh, a lot of these cities and states, they don't really, from a tax basis, they don't really want these things. Um, they don't produce, you know, a lot of property tax. They don't produce a lot of jobs. So if you've got if you've got a city and they've got a prime 25, 30 acre piece of property, they really want uh, a company to come in there that's going to put a lot of really good jobs in, create a lot of taxes, create a lot of, uh, of money there. So a lot of these kind of get grandfathered in. It's almost like own in a mobile home park. If you own one that's already there, you can continue to have it, but they're not ever really excited about somebody building a mobile home park um, outside their, you know, a new mobile home park in your town on a perfect piece of land. Uh, that's a really good point. And, and not only does a site not have the employment and the improvements that generate revenue, but it's probably a little bit of optically doesn't look as nice as a new modern building with just a bunch of vehicles or pipe or equipment stored there so yeah i, I think that is an, an inherent barrier to entry is is having the site that's zoned industrial already that's, whether it's grandfathered in or whether you can just slide that in that's that's a really good point on that and and to some extent that will restrict the amount of supply that's out there so does that is that what leads you to think that that there's more potential in this you've got a 13 acre site now do you do you continue developing that into outdoor storage do you look for more sites down the road like is this is this the entrance to a, a longer runway for industrial outdoor storage for you or is this just a proof of concept type of thing yeah i, I would love to keep doing it um I, I would love to kind of get this one down and then start looking and, and, and buying more of them I, I think you know like you mentioned there's a lot of institutional money that's chasing these right now 
And I think the reason is it's such a fragmented um, market. Self-storage, if you go back 10, 15 years ago, used to be the same way. There's a lot of mom and pop ownership of these pieces of property. So you, you've got a lot of people that own these little stock, these little industrial outdoor storage, truck yards, drop yards. And you're seeing these guys like Zenith and Altera and uh, Criterion. And there's several others that have partnered up with big money to, to, to consolidate this. And, and that's why they're doing it is if they can get it from a fragmented buyers and consolidate a portfolio, there's some, some scale for them to do it. Um, but I, I think it is. I think with it having that barrier to entry and you, you know you're going to be able to maintain some sort of rate. It's not like somebody. One of the things I ran into is self-storage and it hadn't played out yet. But you know, there's so many of them popping up new, 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 new. And so you've got you don't have as much of that. So that's one of the things that interested me about industrial outdoor storage and truck parking. Yeah, great point. If I'd love to dive into the numbers. Uh, so if you could uh, put on your accountant slash internal auditor hat for a second. Uh, so you said you're renting out uh, the stalls for a 73 footer. So is that essentially they get plus or minus a little little bit of leeway on either space, 73 feet by 10 feet? Uh, is, is that a rough approximation of what you'd be renting out for the, how much space they can get? Yeah, they're good. Uh, so they get the 75 foot by 14 feet. And I don't know how wide a, tra a tractor trailer is. I mean, it's probably eight, nine feet. So they've got a few feet on each. And they need that space because they back in so they don't hit the other trailer. So they've got to have a little wiggle room there, too. And typically that gives them a couple feet so they're not sticking out into the into the driveway portion of the of the parking area. So, yeah, that, that's where – and they can park whatever they want to park in there. If they just want to drop the trailer and leave that there or they want to leave their vehicle there during the week, it doesn't really matter to us what they park there. Um, it just it's their dedicated space to do with what they want. And that's one hundred and fifty dollars a month uh, gross. So they're not paying anything over and above that one hundred and fifty. They're paying sales tax. And say in Tennessee for motor vehicles, you have to charge sales tax. So there's a, I guess in our city, it's like nine and three quarter percent sales tax on top of the one hundred and fifty. Yep, but they're not paying anything over and above that. Like you're not charging a management fee or a proportionate share of property taxes or anything on that. Just gross. There's no cam charges or anything like that. No. So on an acre of land, how many vehicles could you get on there? Uh, probably fifteen to twenty. Um, just you got to have you know you got to have a, a, a driveway area, yeah, and then you got to have room for them, and they've got to have plenty of room. You know, for, you know, if you give them seventy five, what I like to do is give them. 75 feet to park in kind of a main midland area, 65, 75 feet for them to be able to turn and back in. And then if you want to put another one on the other side, give them another 75 feet. Um, so that, that gives them plenty of room to be able to turn and park without hitting other trucks. So if my math is correct. That gives you 2,500 to three grand a month of revenue based on, on, on 15 to 20 vehicles. Yeah. Have you have you done the calculation on on with that amount of revenue coming in and what your cost basis to take it to that prepared stake would be? Have you done any any math on to see like what your return would be uh, based on that? Uh, I have. I don't know if I could give you a percentage or anything or an ROI, um, but I have kind of ran it out and said we could probably do 150, 175 truck parking spaces. And I feel like the, the return on investment will be higher than building a warehouse just because, you know, you put in a million dollars on, or let's say a little less than a million dollars to develop this thing out. And you're bringing in, I don't know what the numbers off the top of my head. If you got to say you got 150 trucks, $150, whatever that is on. And there's, there's not a ton of, there is some maintenance. You are dealing with truckers and they're kind of, they can be a little bit of a wily breed, a little throw <laughs> trash out. And, you know, there's some stuff to deal with that. Uh, and then you'll have some long-term maintenance on the road and taking care of it, but there's not major, major expense there. And I, I think it, to me, it's higher than, um, than owning a, a triple net warehouse. Um, I, I can't, I don't have those numbers right in front of me or I should have, I should have prepared those. So you I'll put you on the spot. It. Sorry for that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just, I'm fascinated myself because uh, everything that I've personally invested in is that built up real estate and i'm very fascinated with with this yard concept and so I, i'm asking you out of as a host of a podcast but also just personally i'm just yeah. very fascinated with how you're uh, approaching this uh so, oh sorry go ahead 
I was going to say, I saw, you know, I was looking on LinkedIn and they were, they, I forgot who it was that was, was posting this, but they were showing an Inland Empire. There was a two or three acre site with an old, old warehouse on it. And they literally torn down that warehouse and turned it into industrial outdoor storage because it was such, you know, they could, you know, the, the demand was so high. And I thought that was fascinating. You know, mm-hmm. normally it's the other way around. You take a piece of land and develop it into a, a warehouse, but there was such a demand for being able to park containers or trucks or whatever it was. They, they had gone the other direction. Of course, I think it was an outdated building, uh, but I thought that was pretty interesting. Well, that's, that's interesting because I was going to ask you that question but the opposite way, uh, if there's an element of land banking where you have a parcel of land that perhaps isn't directly in the path of development right now, but it yeah. perhaps could be uh, in five years, maybe that the development is heading that way, all the new properties are coming up and you're in that path. Uh, if you can have a parcel of land and rent it out in the interim for three to five years until development catches up to you. You earn all that revenue instead of just having a dormant piece of land that you're paying property taxes on and, and any debt that you have on it. Now you've actually got a viable business uh, where you're like yourself, you've leased it out to a number of different people. So you're earning income. What that ha- would happen in that, that market is they did the opposite. They actually had an old property and they demolished it to make room for something that was in higher demand. So that, that's, that's fascinating too. Uh, for your standpoint, do you look at this that there's really a clear runway that you could keep this as an operating business for the foreseeable future? Or do you look at it that at some point you still do want to develop this site? That, that, that your point there about the land banking is a really good point. I don't know the answer to that, and um, and that, but I, I think I've got options, and and that's what I like about this particular model is, hey, I can keep renting these truck parking out. If somebody comes along and says, you know what, there's so much demand for a warehouse, we'll give you a good number to to build us a warehouse and lease it. It makes more sense. I've got that option. You, that land banking, I think that's a really good point. I think the key thing is to get a good location. Um, you know, kind of for us to be near an interstate or in an industrial area. We're in an industrial area. We're near several. There's a Coca-Cola bottling area. There's a Kroger, which is a big, um, you all may not have those, but it's a uh, grocery store chain. They've got a big distribution center right next to us. Um, and we're, we're about two miles off the interstate and we've got good roads to this truck parking. So there's a lot of trucks that come through this area. Um, I'm not sure this would do as well if I was in, you know, like you said, some farm area way out in the middle of nowhere. But if you're kind of near the interstate or somewhere where there's a lot of truck traffic, um, it, you know, it, I, th- I think that that's a good place to have one of these. Yeah. And then it really does lead to multiple ways that you can uh, perhaps either sell that or redevelop it or reposition it down the road, as opposed to, uh, and we've already identified that there's problems if you were just to get, Oh, Michael, uh, Ron's here. I was actually going to bring up Ron. So I'm glad that he's in here. He said, yeah, uh, I've seen him on LinkedIn several times. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm going to tell a quick story about Ron in a second here too. Uh, but if we go back to that uh, yard, if you were to try to buy a piece of land in in a rural area, chances of even getting it approved by the municipality to allow for industrial outdoor storage is, is remote. And then what's your exit strategy? Now you've got a piece of land that you've invested in with the gravel and perhaps fencing and, and, and running utilities, but what's your exit strategy? Whereas if you've got your site, you're in an industrial area, large Coca-Cola bottling plant. So there's obviously demand uh, on a larger scale there. Now you could look at it that you might land bank that and have a, a viable source of income for the foreseeable future and then develop that or perhaps sell that uh, as land down the road as it continues to appreciate. So I see a lot of uh, value in in having this strategy. Uh, I, yeah, I, I really like it. I, so I have a few more questions and I do want to open it up. If anyone does have questions for you, uh, I'm again, I'm trying to ask questions because I want to, I, I'm open to doing this myself. I think this is fascinating. And yeah, I want to, you too. yeah I, well, I, and, and I have a few more questions to, before I f- would feel confident on it. And, and I, I, where I was going to bring up Ron is actually, I had a chance to go through one of Ron's properties. He owns a warehouse outside of Dallas and it's an older industrial property in a great area. Like it's actually uh, tucked away behind a whole bunch of retail right off a main road, like great area, just an older industrial property. And he actually leased it out as individual un- uh, spaces in there. So it's not even fenced. It's just, everybody gets a stall in 
there essentially where if they wanted to park some vehicles or they wanted to work on stuff or they wanted to just have a place that was covered uh, from the elements, a little bit of heat in there, it's raining. The day we actually went, it was raining, incidentally. Uh, and he does similar, but just in a actual covered building. And I found that was a very interesting way of taking a property that might not have rented for uh, top value just because it was an older building and now servicing a need where he was full. And I believe he actually even had a waiting list of people that were looking to rent small spaces in there. Very yeah. similar concept, though. Uh, just they're renting a small space of a larger parcel. And the one question I asked him, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, too, is how do you handle the rent, the the lease contract on that so you've got someone that just wants to rent a stall for 150 dollars a month you don't want to be incurring a lot of expenses getting that lease dealt with what what does your form of lease look like when you're renting to one of these these groups yeah so i i've, I've come in from a self-storage background so i just have used self-storage software i've got a website if you go to my cleveland truck parking.com you can go on there there's none available right now so you can't rent one but you can go on there browse it look at it look at some pictures look at look at a video and and then if you want to rent it you just go on and you rent it online and then i'll, I'll what i'll do one step i'll have them do after they've signed up is i'll email and say hey send me a, a, a copy of your insurance i make sure i like them to have um insurance in case they ding into somebody else um or, or hit something that way i don't have to get in the middle of it i could just put them together so that their insurance covers any damage um, but so it's done all online. It's not like I got a meal. They're signing a lease online. Uh, and, and so that software keeps up with it. It bills them every month, um, just like a self storage unit. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that for me, that's been similar to self storage. I'm not meeting these folks very rarely. I'll, if somebody just wants to see it, I can, it's pretty close to my office. So I'll go over and meet them. Uh, but for the most part, it's pretty automated. I, I, li I like that parallel on it's almost industrial self storage. It's where there's a self storage industry for people that need to store stuff for their house or for their small business. There's land where companies need to lease it for a similar type of purpose. And if you look at it the same way as that, then then I think that streamlines the process. Uh, Wyatt, I don't know if you're able to, but could you put that website up? Because uh, I think anybody that's considering this could take a look at your website and just see how you structured it to to replicate that, uh, myclevelandtrucking.com. Is that what it was? Myclevelandtruckparking.com. Truckparking.com. And, and this by no means is the gold standard. I just, it's just kind of how I worked it out. So. Well, it, it's working for you if you're full. Uh, and if you're full and you're considering expanding, you've obviously uncovered something that that's working. So I, I, I think for people that are considering doing something and there, there's a lot of people out there that are just sitting on land, uh, that, that they don't know what to do with. And I think that this, this provides a very viable stream of income uh, until they do decide what they want to do. And maybe it works so well that they, like yourself, consider expanding into the other parcels of land that you have uh, to fill that need. Oh, 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 I guess the next question, so we've addressed the rent, addressed the cost of getting into there, addressed the lease contract. I, I did want to touch on insurance, so I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's important as well. You don't want to have one incident erode a year's worth of profit. Uh, so having the insurance is key. How are you attracting the tenants? Like, What are you doing to actually get people to contact you? Um. I've done a couple of things. One, if you're looking just for the onesie twosie, the, the owner operator, uh, one of the best things I found is Facebook Marketplace. Uh, just mm -hmm. putting a, a free or even if you kind of boost the ad on Facebook, I've gotten several of them that way. Um, I, with being self-storage, I've got a little bit of background on search engine optimization. Um, and so I've tried to make sure that I've got it on Google Maps. I've got it. You know, the, the, the website is somewhat optimized for keywords that people are looking for, like truck parking, Cleveland. Um, and so I, I try to just do that. So it's pretty, I, I don't really have much of an advertising budget. And the thing you've got going for you is there's so much demand for truck parking that they're, they're quite honestly happy to find a place when they do find one. Um, and so I think that, that, that helps, you know, you're not out there fighting with other truck parking places trying to get that, that spot. If you've got one open, they're, they're, they're telling their friends about it. So that, that's been very help. I was thinking now, does Ron, does he have some industrial outdoor storage? I was thinking I could be wrong on that. I was thinking he's, he's got some of this too. He does. Yeah. I, okay. I, I don't know if he, I think that the, the one site that he had, he was doing storage on there uh, and why okay. I just pulled up the, the website here too. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, we'll we'll get Ron to chime in because it, uh, yeah, I think you and him actually are, are like think very similar uh, on how you can take a site that perhaps what other people didn't see value in and find a way to uh, get value add. I, I think both of you share that very sen same sentiment is that a people overlook a lot of sites uh, and perhaps because they just think it's overwhelming. Uh, like for myself, before I walk through that building with Ron, I would have thought that that would have been a management nightmare having to oversee that many tenants, uh, having to deal with month to month tenants and the rollover, but very similar to yourself. Uh, I'll have to get Ron on, on a future episode to talk more about it because I, it, I, yeah. I, I thought it was very labor intensive, but much like yourself. And I think having that self storage background is very helpful because you approach it the same way is that you try to automate as many things uh, as opposed to having to go and meet someone on site and collect the rent monthly uh, and oversee all <laughs> the different tenants. Like, that'd be a yeah. management nightmare. And I know that self storage industries transitioned away from that too, where, where a lot of uh, sites don't even have an on site manager anymore. It's, it's all done remotely. And I think that's why it's probably blown up so much over the last 10 years, um, self-storage. for Because used to, you had to have an on-site manager. Somebody had to go and sign this lease in person, and you had to give them, a, you know, let them in the gate and everything. And now, if you've got, you know, you, you one person can cover 10, 15, 20 sites, you know, with no problem because, you know, you just forward all the phone calls to your cell phone, and you sign up online, and you're never going to meet them. And, you know, they, they put their own lock on a unit, and you give them the gate code once they've uploaded everything they're supposed to. So, yeah, I think that's why, you know, if you had a, a 50, 60, 100 unit space, it didn't make sense before, you know, financially, you can, no, no big operator was interested in buying that because by the time they put an employee on that and spread that cost over a hundred units, it, didn't, it was financially not viable. Or now they're like, yeah, that's all online. We can send somebody there a couple times a week to do maintenance and check the units, but we can combine that one person with 10, 15, 20 other units and, and, uh, and and make it financially viable. Yeah, so kind of how I'm listening to you talk about this is that there's barriers to entry because you just can't find these sites everywhere. So there's a limited amount of supply and there's a lot of demand. So you don't even need to be spending a lot of money on marketing because people are intentionally, tr deliberately trying to look for this stuff. So as long as you just even put up a sign, people are going to find you and tell their, tell their friends. Uh, and big technology has put it in a spot where you don't need to be as manually involved in it. So I, it's almost like that trifecta, like a perfect storm of, of like an opportunity uh, that, and, and, and this is clearly why it's, it's blowing up over the past year is because it's this confluence of conditions has led to this optimal spot where you, you've got uh little competition lots of demand you're full uh yeah i really i really like uh this this space on that so i can see why you get so excited just even thinking about this uh what, what would you say to someone that like myself and you you can even just speak directly to me uh what would you say to me if i were looking at this like what, what would you say to someone to start I think the key thing is just finding a location, um, find somewhere or, you know, find somebody that's got one that's not been run well and try to buy it from them. You know, I think that's what you're seeing these big groups, the Alteros and the Zenus and all, all these big groups that are doing this. They're basically, they just got people that are out calling um, people that already own these spots and, and trying to buy them. Um, it, 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 you know, they're trying to buy from the mom and pops that maybe they haven't, maybe they haven't ran it as efficiently and got rents where they, technically should be where somebody like you who's uh, uh, very aware of what the market rate is and it's going to really market that to get the maximum rental dollars out of it you know you might be able to buy it and, and, and make it more efficient or make the raise rents and and make it much more valuable because of the, the cash flow on it uh, i think would, that would be your smartest thing is to go out and maybe make you a list of you know whatever your market is if you want to go 100 miles from your house and just say I'm going to go out and take the time or hire some sort of virtual assistant to go out and find all these locations and then just call them and talk to them or send them a mailer. Or, um, that's kind of what I did on my storage units when I started doing that. And that's probably what I really ought to do more um, on this on this market uh, is just go out and try to build a database of these places that you'd be interested in buying and then talk to them and form a relationship. And then at some point you're going to get some some small number of them. You can look at a lot of different properties and eventually get one. And I think that's probably your, your best way to do it. Great advice. Do you need to answer that door? 
No, no, I got to, that's okay. You, you're, you're priority number one. Yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And that, that really is great advice. Uh, I, I have one more question to ask, uh, but I, I do want to get to some of the comments uh, that, that are questions that are coming in. Uh, Neil from Leadership to All, thanks for joining in. And the question, how many legal requirements are there for outdoor real estate properties compared to self-storage or warehouse? Uh, for example, amount of light drainage safety. I, I think we touched on that a little bit, but anything to add on that, Michael? I think, you know, one of the things I would do, I think that your legal stuff is a very good point. I, I would probably get in each county, each municipality is going to have different requirements that you're going to need to look at. Uh, and so make sure you are, you know, you know work, I work with an, uh, a civil engineer, um, but make sure that, you know, they're aware of, you know, hey, can you even put this in this location? Um, and, and they'll help you know specifically. I think, I don't know if it's a legal requirement to have lights. We just did it as a you know, good business practice to kind of keep down the, um, some of the petty crime and the video cameras and, um, drainage is a big deal, you know, like stormwater drainage, you gotta have, you've gotta have, um, uh, detention ponds or retention ponds for that. But I worked with the civil engineers on that. I'm not a, I, that part of it, I'm not an expert on. A great point on that. And, and it reinforces something that I talk about all the time is that anytime you're making a real estate decision, you want to have a full team of experts assisting you in it because there's nobody out there that knows every single thing about the, the property and the laws and the ordinances and everything with it. So you, you need to have a team. So it's no different whether you're looking at a building or a land, you need to make sure you have that team with you. Uh, Ron, uh, how do you mark spaces? We have issues with wide parkers. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, if you've got a good answer to that, I'm, I'm all ears. Um, what I do currently, and this is by no means the best answer, is I just have a market with spray paint. I've got one of those wands that's got an upside down spray paint, and I'll go out there about every six to eight weeks, and I'll just spray the lines um, to do it. But I, th there needs to be a, a longer term solution. Um, with it being gravel, you know, they just weather away, as opposed to you know, if you if it was an asphalt property. You know, I think you could get a good striping done to be done for a long, long period of time. I, I, I think if I'm guessing what he's getting at is maybe they don't have more spaces and the people are parking outside of their their space. And I, I could definitely see that happening. And, and I've had that. I've had people even with the lines, they'll park outside their space and that other trucker next door or, or the next unit over, he's going to be mad. And so you have to call that person and say, hey, you're in that guy's space. He can't get in his spot. Um, and, and that is because they are, they can be, most of them are really, really good folks, but some of them can be a little testy. They tend to be, people get in trucking tend to be in, independent minded. Um, and so they'll, they'll let you know if something's not right. How often do you deal with those types of incidents? It's been pretty low. I mean, I, it hasn't been that bad. I've had, you know, one, I had one group of tenants, they finally moved out that they, they parked over the line or they were they, they they were working on converting some of their um trailers um and so they were doing some work on them and they were a little messy they would leave some trash and so forth but for the most part they've been pretty good knock on wood the, the truckers i have they, they've been they've been good folks i guess if there's very low supply and high demand the last thing that they want to do is get kicked out of that site so you'd have to expect that they're going to try to be respectful of that to, to some extent uh, Ron says uh, they have signs experimented with rope nailed in the ground. Yeah, that's that's an interesting idea. I, I, I guess that is just one of the things that people have to be aware of is that you do need to respect almost an, an invisible boundary. Or if you can come up with a solution like Ron did with rope and 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 spikes tied into there. Uh, question: did some string, and I wonder how big a rope he used or how long that lasted for him. My string, as they ran over that string, it ripped it up, tore it up. So I tried that and I used that, but I had some stripe lines down. I used that initially to stripe the lines. Um, but as they ran over the rope, it tore up my rope. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested if he used any kind of specific kind of rope to keep that, to keep that from uh, occurring. We'll see if, uh, if he has a comment on that. Uh, another question from Neil, what physical aspects of a property would make you want or not want to own it? Uh, for example, neighbors, closeness to highways. Closest to highway is, uh, is a key thing. You know, anywhere with truckers are going to be, you know, if you can be near an interstate intersection or an interstate exchange where people are getting on and off, uh, where there's a lot of industrial property, there's a lot of warehouses. Uh, I think that's really, that's going to make it more valuable um, to be in that area where there's going to be a lot of truckers, a lot of 
a lot of where a lot of industrial property where they somebody may need to store construction equipment outside or they may need to store inventory outside because a lot of some of these folks will store inventory is cheaper to store it outside than it is inside under a warehouse so if they got something that doesn't have to stay dry it makes sense for them just to put it outside it saves them a lot of money have you had any issues with with crime like you mentioned it's fenced you have lights you have camera have you had any anyone report any break-ins or anything not at this facility and self-storage i'll get it you know once a year we'll get somebody breaking a unit or something uh but i'm not knock on wood i've not had any problems so far hmm, interesting yeah i guess i guess something that everyone needs to be cognizant of to the to the point that neil asked about being next to a residential area would that affect you at all or, or is it just if the if the zoning allows for it it, it, it is what it is I think that's probably it. I don't I, I think you know trying to get it zoned and approved for it you may get some pushback from the residents um if it's right next to them if they see it as being you know if you don't have good barriers of trees and space if it's an eyesore to them you know they may come out when you're trying to get it zoned or get it approved for that use and deny it um and I think you know the getting it zoned for it if it's in a residential area will be I don't know the answer that if you could get it zoned for it, I think it would just depend on your, your city and your, whoever the person is in charge of approving that the city council or whatever. What would your thoughts be on somebody that owns an industrial property and perhaps there's already a building on it, but there's surplus land. Would yeah. you see any challenges or inherent issues with uh, ha- taking some of that surplus land and using it as truck storage? Or, or do you, I, I guess what, what I'd be trying to get now, would there be any conflict with the existing tent of the, of the building and then the increased traffic that would come from the trucks? Do you foresee that as an issue? I mean, potentially, yeah. I think you'd have to look at how your lease is. I mean, are they, are they leasing just the building and plus certain number of parking places? Or are they saying, hey, they've got the entire facility. It's all theirs, land and all, depending on how that lease has worked out. But I mean, certainly if you're proactive and said, hey, I'm going to develop out another acre of parking and that, that's separate. That's not yours. Uh, be upfront with them. Let them know what's happening. Um, I, I think that'd be a great way to add you some additional, additional revenue. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm thinking too, is because I, I think there's a lot of properties like that where there is surplus land that isn't being used. So there just could be another means and, and it might already be graveled and fenced and powered. Yeah. So if, if that's the case, it wouldn't be a huge, amount of extra labor to convert that to outdoor storage so I, yeah I, th- I think that that's a very interesting way too is whether someone yeah. looks at that as a dedicated plan on going to find land and doing it or perhaps there just is surplus land and maybe that's a way someone can look at a, a property that maybe doesn't make quite sense on the numbers uh so if they're considering buying a property uh, they can't quite get it to pencil if there is some surplus land there could be another way that you could get additional revenue and that might might be the difference to help make that property make sense. So uh, I, I saw a comment from Darren come in and uh, I think this is a really good uh, comment. If you could pull that one up, Wyatt. Uh, and thanks for joining in too, Darren. Uh, iOS seems like the wild west, not a lot of data and not a lot of specialized brokers. I couldn't agree more on both of those points. Uh, because it's probably the same with you in Chattanooga. You're probably one of the few sites that actually does this. How, how would you value your site? Would it just be purely on income? So you apply a cap to it and now there's your estimate of value or how would you come up with comparables for what the site's worth? No, I think you got a good point. I think that's probably why there's so much interest in it is it's so fragmented and it's, you know, it's not, it hasn't been like warehousing or some of these more, um, these classes of, of real estate that are so not down. And that, uh, to me, I think that's some of the value to it is there is some, um, some of that there. Um, you know, for me, if I was looking at it, I would just look at it as what, what kind of income can I make off of? What's my revenue going to be? What are my expenses going to be? What's it going to cost to develop it? Um, and then just kind of back into it of, you know, what would it be that I need to get in order to, to make it cash flow? You know, I think one of the things that's made all real estate more difficult, or not more difficult, but it's just, it makes it harder for people to pay high prices. It's just, you know, interest rates have gone up so much, you know, in the last 12 months, you know, that, that was another thing I was afraid of on building a warehouse is for me, I would have been building it started the warehouse and I wouldn't have been able to get permanent financing until after I finished. And I was looking at these interest rates and I, I knew they were going to go up, but I didn't know how high, but you'd hate to get into a project thinking you're going to be in it 
five percent and you know end up financing at seven and a half percent you could end up underwater pretty quick on your cash flows and uh, so that's another reason i like this is it was a little smaller and i could i could kind of take a nibble and see how i liked it and see how it went and then i could go from there yeah i just read this morning too uh old j pow is saying that uh interest rates might even go up more than 25 basis points uh every quarter now so uh I, and i think the feds use the media to to try and almost soft announce what they're going to do to see what the reaction on that is. Uh, but if, if he's saying that perhaps 50 basis point increases are on the table in the near future, uh, they're, they're obviously concerned about inflation. So it, it's, it's going to be a problem uh, the the interest rate. I don't think the story is, is done uh, for 2023. I, I think that there still could be some more pain in the forecast. So for someone that, that like yourself, does, doesn't want to just take on more interest rate risk, I, I think there's a lot of reasons to be uh, optimistic about that. Uh, ben Franklin, uh, well, it's, it's an honor to have Ben Franklin uh, uh, join yeah. us. Thank, thanks for joining in and, and for the question. Uh, is this good use for land in a flood zone? That's a very interesting idea. Uh, would lenders be less strict regarding flood insurance is there's no real improvements that's a great question uh i i i, I don't know the answer to that um i think there's possibly i think you need to kind of work with your insurance I, I think the only thing i could think of is the people parking their trucks there or their whatever they're storing if they're storing some sort of good that's sensitive to water um if you flood that you certainly want to disclose to them that they're in a flood zone and there is that risk um and i don't know how excited they would be to be parking Possibly, though, if it only floods every once in a while and you disclose it to them and they make sure their insurance covers it, I guess, you know, potentially I think you could. That's something to look at. Yeah, I, great point you brought up there, too, is that make sure that if you are doing that, you don't have a whole lot of risk because your your risk is uh, no different than just a, a big rainfall. Uh, so it's the land itself isn't going to be at, at risk. But I think ensuring that your tenants know about it, that, that's something you wouldn't want to conceal from a trucker that's renting the space. You wouldn't want to say it's not in a flood zone because like you said, if it did flood, <laughs> they have an insurance problem. If they went back to you and said, you didn't disclose that this isn't a flood zone, then then you're just opening yourself up to, to pain. So I, I th that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up is from your standpoint, you probably don't have a whole lot of risk, but you do want to disclose to to the tenants. And that'd be interesting to see on, on, on whether a company would insurance provider would say, well, if you're parked in a flood zone and, and you know it's a flood zone and it floods, you might not be indemnified for that. That's that's, that's an interesting... Yeah, uh, that's a good uh, question. Yeah, a great question though. I mean, that, that is something to consider is that uh, sometimes you might have a parcel of land that just isn't great for, for development, uh, whether it's for insurance reasons or, or any number of reasons. It might just not be good to have a building go up. So this could be another reason to, uh, to look into uh, outdoor storage. So thanks for the question on that. Um, if, if we have any other questions, please feel free to put it up. I, I want the one question I wanted to ask was on the environmental standpoint, do you feel there's any environmental risk from having all these trucks parked, uh, on the site for any amount of time and whether it's they're leaking oil or leaking diesel, or are you concerned about that at all? No, that, that, that's a good point. We, we've definitely that is something I watch them pretty close to make sure they're not doing any kind of fluid type, you know, Hey, you can't be working on your vehicle. Um, watch that and try to, you know, let them know you're not allowed to dump anything out there. Uh, no gasoline or oil changes or anything like that. Um, I guess there's some amount of risk, like anywhere people are parking, you're going to have a certain amount of transmission fluid or windshield wiper fluid or whatever come out uh, wherever they park. If they're parking on your warehouse parking lot or your normal land, um, there is, there is some risk to that. Do you try to address that as much as possible in, in that standard lease agreement that you have, like just under terms and conditions on what they can and can't do? Yes. Yeah. Like I'm not allowing anybody to store hazardous material. We know that, you know, um, um, and, and try to stay proactive on that. I and mean, we, we do have those standard disclosures about you're not around dump anything. You're not allowed to put it, store anything that's inappropriate. Um, but I, th I think, I mean, it, there's always the risk of the environmental. Um, I, I don't know if it's any higher parking a truck here versus parking a truck on a warehouse facility um, than wherever they're parking. As long, you just want to make sure they're not doing mechanical work or doing oil changes or doing things where they're pouring out liquids on, on your property. 
Yeah, you, I agree with you completely. There's there's environmental risk everywhere. There's environmental risk in residential areas where there's that, that's where we have our cars parked all the time. So there are always is that element of risk. I, and I think you just try to mitigate it, like you said, by by in the terms and conditions on what they are and aren't allowed to do. So, yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Uh, I, I guess we'll wrap up with, I'd love just to get your outlook. What, what do you think's in store for the rest of 2023? What's your outlook for, for the foreseeable future? None of us have a crystal ball, but I always just love to hear people's uh, opinions on this. Yeah, that you're, you're right. I, I don't know. Um, I think I'm interested to see, you know, interest rates going up so much. A lot of commercial real estate, particularly if it's done by local banks or, um, they'll usually, they'll have like three to five year of resets on interest rates. And so a lot of people, you know, over the last couple of years have gotten in at low rates, you know, 4% or three and a half percent. I'm just interested to see when those terms reset uh, uh, the, the pain, you know, if, where you might've got in at three and a half percent, you might be at 8% now if you had to reset that thing. Um, and so I'm interested to see over the next three, five years, if rates stay up, how that's going to affect um, buyers and how that affects opportunities to buy from, from other folks. Um, I, I don't know. I have no idea if we're going to have a recession or where interest rates are going to go. Um, but I think overall, I think, you know, I'm bullish on America. I think, you know, it'll, it'll do well. Um, we've got our problems, but I think uh, it's the best system we've got. And Canada is good too. I'm speaking to Canadians. So I got to be careful here. Um, you got, you guys have got a great place too. Um, but I, I feel good about where I'm at. I like the local area. I like being in Tennessee. I like Chattanooga. It's, it's business friendly. Um, we've got, um, I, I, there's, there's no craziness really going on here that some places have to deal with. Um, so I, I feel, you know, generally pretty good for the next five, 10 years. Yeah, I share I share your optimism. I think North America as a whole is is a great place to be, and it's we're insulated from a lot of the effects that happen in other parts of the world. So I'm with you. Short term, I have no idea what happens in the immediate future. Uh, interest rates will be uh, interesting to watch, but long term, I'm I'm still very bullish on North America and industrial specifically. So really do want to thank you for uh, uh, sharing all your information. Oh, oh, sorry. Beverly's putting up some of your information right now. The birthday thank girl, you. she's helping out uh, at the end here. We should, we should be doing something nice for you on your birthday, Beverly, and you're helping us out. So she's putting up uh, your website and I, I do have your LinkedIn uh, in the uh, description as well. So I'd encourage people to reach out to you. Uh, and just again, want to th uh, thank you for joining me on this call, Michael. And thanks to everybody that, uh, that tuned in. Uh, but Michael, thanks again. Hope to, we can keep in touch on this too. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thanks everyone. Have a good, great day.